Good afternoon, ChemCom students. I'm creating a video walkthrough for the assignment for Wednesday, March 2nd. So here's how you get to it. Please open up your classroom, your Google Classroom. Click from Stream over to Classwork, as I'm sure you have already done. And here in the Wednesday 3-2 topic is today's assignment, Temperature and Particle Motion Gizmo. So go ahead and click to open that up. It looks like this. Now, if you are doing this on paper, you'll put your name. You can put the date. If you're choosing to do it electronically, there's no need for that because it automatically tells me it's your assignment. All right, everybody's got that up. So now go back to your class link dashboard. Looks like this. And you're going to scroll until you find the icon that is a white G inside of a blue background. And you're going to open that up. And we're waiting. Here it is. Click on your class. And the only gizmo available for you is the temperature and particle motion one. So go ahead and launch that to follow along, which I know you're all doing right now. You definitely don't have me muted. Okay, so let's go to the gizmo. We'll do the warm up questions. Why is hot air hot? What makes it hot? Somebody knows. Okay, I bet you a few of you have thought of a reason. Basically, it's adding energy to the air generally energy in the form of heat. And then why is cold air cold? We'll reverse the process. If adding energy makes hot air hot, then what would make cold air cold? Taking away energy. You smart kids, I'm sure you came up with that. Okay, so the next one, air consists of molecules. How do they move in hot air and cold air? So if you have a, let's picture you with a lot of energy. What are your movements like? Yeah, pretty fast. So hot air particles move quickly. And then reverse that for cold air. You're going two days without sleep and you haven't eaten much, you're probably pretty slow. So cold air molecules move slowly. So that's what we're learning about today. So let's look at the warm up. So we're talking about the Kelvin scale, which is measured starting at absolute zero, where all particle motion stops. And we're going to play with the heat here. Hydrogen, 300 K. And I'm pretty sure that's where it is. Hydrogen, 300 K. What are those things moving like? I'm going to click these two. Yeah, about medium speed. Describe the motion. Medium speed. Um, random motion. Because we didn't see any real pattern if we look again. They're just sort of squiggling around. No real pattern. Are they all moving at the same speed? No. Keep going. Move the temperature slider back and forth. Focus on the particle motion at left. What do you notice? Let's see if we can notice what we said would happen. So here it is all the way down to 50. Slowly slide that up. Look at that. Did you notice what happened? The higher the temperature, the quicker the particles move. You observant guys and gals, students. All right, so the temperature is measure of average kinetic energy. Based on this formula, 
how will the temperature change if you increase the average velocity? So velocity squared. So an increase in the velocity is going to have a big impact or a small impact. It's velocity squared. So any velocity you put in is not quite doubled, squared. So it's going to have the temp, let's see, the velocity going up will drastically, I like that word, increase the temperature. How will the temperature change if you increase the mass? So mass is not squared. Mass and energy are both a one-to-one. -one. So the mass and temperature will go up linearly. Because it's a one-to-one -one ratio. So here we go. Predict. Oxygen molecules are 16 times as massive as hydrogen at the same temperature, which would move faster. So you're talking about oxygen, a big heavy guy, or hydrogen, a teeny weeny one. Which one moves faster? Hydrogen. Smaller particles, I'm going to say molecules, move faster. I would say it's the same in real life, but I have seen people who are much bigger than me able to run much faster, so we can't compare it to real life. But in gas terms, small particles or molecules move faster. So let's see. Let's see if we're right. We're going to select oxygen. We'll keep it at this really high speed. Look at that. If we switch back to hydrogen again, you can see the difference. The oxygen moves slower. So based on the definition of temperature given above, explain why oxygen molecules move more slowly than hydrogen molecules at the same temperature. So here we go. It's the average kinetic energy of the particles. So larger particles have um, lower kinetic energy. That's about what we were trying to get at. All right, so we're setting our hydrogen and 300. Let's see what we do next. Hydrogen, 300. All right, so the graph on the right side represents the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution of particle velocities. The curve is a probability of particles moving at the velocity shown on the x-axis. The higher the curve, the greater the probability of finding a particle moving at the velocity will be. Move the temperature slider back and forth. This time, focus on the right side. What do you notice about the shape of the graph? So let's, we're looking right over here at this graph. Let's slide it all the way down. Look at that. The probability of finding particles moving at this speed goes way up. And as we move it over, you can see that it's not a sharp curve anymore. The graph sort of not quite flattens out, but we'll say it. the graph gets flatter. That's kind of what happens. So now look to the left side of the graph as you raise it from 50 to 1,000. Even at the highest temperature, are there still a slow, a few slow particles? So let's see. This is the highest temperature. Are there still particles over here? 
This is a probability curve. So anything underneath the curve is possible. So you can see there is still, yes, there's still a few slow particles. At what temperature do you see the widest variety of particle velocity? So let's look at that again. So here we have a lot of room underneath this graph. And as we move it colder, see how the, the space sort of narrows, the velocity sort of narrows. And if we go further and further to the cold side, there's less and less width underneath this curve, which means the velocities they're traveling are narrowing. So at what temperature? At 1,000 K. In general, is it symmetrical or asymmetrical? Let's look. If we cut it down the middle, is it the same on both sides? Here it looks like it. Here you can see it's still sort of the same on both sides. Looking the same. If we go through, those of you with an eye for art, you can see it's generally but not quite always symmetrical. So I would say symmetrical. you guys. Look at you learning about particle motion. Be proud of yourselves. All right. So because particles have a wide range of velocities at any given temperature, it is useful to calculate the average velocities. Physicists es express the average velocity in three ways. Most probable, mean, and root mean. Set the temperature to 200 and the guess to hydrogen. This time I'm going to do this. There we go. Estimate the most probable velocity by looking at the peak of the curve. What is your estimate? Ooh, fun. Looking at data. So here's the peak, the highest point. If we go down, I'd say about 1,200 meters per second. M dash S. Turn on the most probable velocity. Oh, I already had that clicked. Look at that. 1284. We were pretty darn close. Based on the shape of the curve, do you think most of the particles are moving faster or slower? Let's take a look. Is there more area over here or over here? I would say over here, so that's faster. Good job, guys. I'm sure you're following along with me and not just typing in the answers. I know that's happening. All right, so the mean velocity is the average velocity based on the shape of the curve in your answer. Do you expect the mean velocity to be greater or less than? So more, here's the mean, or the, what they call it, most probable. And there's more room over here. So if there's more outliers that are faster, that would push the mean faster than most probable. More molecules. Molecule speeds on the right side of the line. If you were taking the average of three numbers, you have two and two. That's the most probable number, but then you have 27. You add those three and divide, your average is going to be way higher than the most probable number of those three. Okay, I hope that helps you understand because it's kind of a picky difference here. So predict or look at the mean velocity, which I actually had clicked. Look at that, 1,449. We were right. Yay, us.
meters per second because numbers without units are useless. Is your prediction correct? Of course it was, because you guys are just that smart. All right, so try a variety of other gases and temperatures. Is the mean always greater than the most probable? Let's take a look. Helium. So most probable 912, mean 1029. Oxygen, 322, 364, so far yes. CO2, water vapor. Look at all those waters. So I'd say in general, yes. Why is this so? There are always best outliers. It happens. And like I said with the example above, if you have three numbers, you have two, you have two, and you have 27. You write those down on paper, you put them in a bag, your most probable pick out of that bag is two. But if you took all three of those numbers and added them and averaged it, the average is going to be way higher than the most probable. All right, so this is what I'm going to do with you. The rest is definitions, vocabulary for our upcoming slash ongoing unit where we're learning all about air chemistry. I'd like for you to use Google and look up the definition of the word troposphere, barometer, kinetic molecular theory, Boyle's law, absolute zero, Charles law, Ideal gas, Avogadro's law, and molar volume. All right, define those and then you can turn this in. On paper or electronically, it is your choice. Thank you for watching.